All right, Scyther versus Pinsir. Welcome, everyone. Today, we will be racing these two Generation 1 bug Pokemon head-to-head -head through Pokemon Fire Red, including the Round 2 Elite Four, using only my starter. Because of the competitive nature of these runs, I will allow myself a single egg move for each Pokemon. Further rules are in the description, but we have a lot to cover, so let's start getting into things. On the surface, they seem quite similar, but when I was researching these Pokemon initially, I saw Scyther had Technician and Pinsir had Mold Breaker, both of which I was so excited to use. But then I discovered that neither of those abilities existed in Gen 3. No! I'm writing this script after the initial playthroughs, so I have some prescient knowledge, and despite not getting the abilities I wanted, these two runs were a ton of fun to solve. Let's roll a die to see who plays first. Yes, I do do this before playing the runs because I'm super indecisive sometimes. Heh, <laughs> doo doo. Scyther can be odds, pincer evens. 17. I choose you, Scyther! With a base stat total of 500 and both its speed and attack over 100, Scyther can be very threatening. Its biggest drawbacks in Fire Red are its typing and move pool. Shrimp is four times weak to rock moves and has a type disadvantage to a lot of other types that present big obstacles throughout the run, including electric, fire, and ice. Because of its outstanding speed, I've chosen a brave nature, increasing attack and decreasing speed by 10% respectively. In solo challenges, there is a certain threshold of speed when it just becomes excessive, and I'd rather allocate those stats somewhere more important. Brock presents a massive obstacle for Scyther. His Onyx knows Rock Tomb, which we are four times weak to. It also lowers your speed when it hits, so it sets Onyx up for some great wombo combos to take us out. This is why I've chosen our egg move to be Reversal. Reversal is a move that's base power is inversely proportional to your current HP. At full health, its power is only 20, but when you have between 0 and 4% of your max health, its power is 200. This is definitely a move that requires working smarter, not harder. After clearing all of the trainers in Viridian Forest, I take my first shot at Brock. My thought process here is to get Geodude to damage me super low so that I can outspeed and hopefully one-shot Onyx. After a whole bunch of turns of Geodude using defense curls and whittling down our health, Geodude tackles us to one hit point. Ooh, excuse me while I shudder, that is towing my comfort line pretty aggressively. Unfortunately, we leveled up after defeating Geodude, bringing Scyther up to 3 hit points as Onyx comes out. This is around 7% of our max health, meaning Reversal's power will now be 150 instead of 200. As a result, we don't get the one-shot and Onyx easily knocks us out. I played around with this same strategy for a few resets, trying to figure out this problem. I knew there was a solution that didn't involve grinding, I just couldn't see it yet. Then, I figured this out. First, I made sure my experience was low enough that knocking out Geodude wouldn't level us up. Then I got myself poisoned by a Weedle in Viridian Forest. I then paced back and forth in front of Brock, diligently checking my HP until Scyther was at 1. In Fire Red, poison will knock your Pokémon out in the overworld, so I quickly cure the status with an antidote. Scyther's outstanding speed allows Shrimp to move first and strike both Brock's Geodude and Onyx with a 400 effective power reversal, including their weakness to the fighting type. That was definitely a Eureka moment that I am super proud of. With Brock defeated, we've overcome a massive obstacle. Without the use of reversal, I don't even want to imagine how much Shrimp would have had to grind here. But we're not out of the woods yet. Rival 2 and Misty both remain big threats. I don't think Scyther is ready for Misty, so I face Rival 2 instead. His Pidgeotto and Charmander have super effective moves against Shrimp. In my first attempt, we're taking some big hits from both, and using Quick Attack, I end up knocking Charmander into Blaze Range, powering up his Ember, which then knocks us out. I try again immediately, this time remembering that any time we're below about a third health, Reversal will be doing significantly more damage. I take more damage from Pidgeotto this time, so when Charmander comes out, I switch to Reversal. Our first hit deals around the same damage as Quick Attack would, but then Charmander knocks us down to 8 HP. That's about 13% of our max health, so we're now hitting with 100 base power instead of 40, taking out Charmander. I was definitely scared of Rattata's quick attack here, but after he lands one, it's only doing 5 damage. Phew, we're moving on. 
Shortly after, on Route 25, I make sure to pull down Camper Flint, giving us access to TM43's secret power. This is a 70 base power normal move that has a 30% chance of a secondary effect based on terrain. 95% of the time in this run, that effect will be Paralysis, an excellent physical addition to our moveset. With that boost to our moveset and a few extra levels, I now feel prepared for Misty. I have my Person Berry equipped, and on turn 1, we Oko, or one-hit knockout her lead Staryu. Her Starmie is much more threatening though. We get lucky on turn 1 with Secret Power paralyzing it. From there, ugh, poor Starmie, it has an awful time being fully paralyzed a total of 3 times, or every time it tried attacking. I wish it could have landed one hit simply so I'd see the damage for future reference. Dommage. I end up wiping once against Rival 3 on the SSN because of some awful sand attack luck. A single one from Pidgeotto destroyed us. This fight though is a much better indication of Scyther's power ramping up. We smash through the Rival's team and at the end of the battle we level to 26 learning Wing Attack. Wing Attack is why Technician would have been such a great ability for us. Technician increases the power of any move with a base power of 60 or less by 50%. So including Stab, or same type attack bonus, it would have had an effective power of 135 instead of its current 90. Instead though, we're stuck with Swarm, which will unfortunately be completely irrelevant for this entire run. Moving on to Lieutenant Surge, we get to appreciate the offensive capabilities of our Mantis Pokémon. Despite our type disadvantage, we're faster and hit way harder than all of Surge's Pokémon. We clean him up for a decisive third badge. The game now opens up a lot for Scyther, but I wonder how Pinsir's been doing. Pinsir has a slightly different approach to the early game than Scyther. It's more physically powerful in both attack and defense, and starts with a slightly more powerful move in Vice Grip. He's a bit slower than Scyther though, and for that reason I'm using an adamant nature, increasing our attack and reducing special attack. Pinsir has two big things working against it though for the early game. Its egg move selection is much more limited, and my biggest concern in choosing one for both Pokémon was getting through Brock. The best option I could see initially is Faint Attack, to target Brock's special stats. The second big disadvantage is that unlike Scyther who has a medium fast growth rate, Pinsir has the slow growth rate. Because of this I once again clear out all of the trainers in Viridian Forest on my way to Brock. In my first attempt against Brock, Faint Attack seems to be doing a decent job against Geodude. We're doing about a third of his health every attack, and because of Pinscher's outstanding defensive stat, Geodude is doing very little damage to us. Turn 1 against Onyx though squashes any hope of getting through this fight quickly. Our Faint Attack is doing a fifth? Less? While well, Onyx hits a super effective Rock Tomb for around half of our health. It also lowers our speed, so Onyx is now moving first, sealing Pincher's fate. Hmm, okay, okay, okay. I backtrack through the forest, keeping myself in the grass the whole way, clearing wild battles, and defeat Rival 1.5 back on Route 22. He's the last good experience yield before Brock, so it helps to reduce the grinding. At the end of my mini-adventure, Pincer levels up to 13, learning Seismic Toss. Seismic Toss is a fixed damage move that will always strike an opponent for damage equal to your Pokémon's level, in this case 13. Geodude has 31 health, so we need 3 shots to defeat it, but it's the Onyx that's the real problem. Onyx has 33 health, so it will also take 3 hits to defeat. At level 13 we're taking less damage from Rock Tomb, and had the good fortune of Onyx missing its first attack, so we clean up Brock and Pincher's sights are now set on Cerulean City. Pinsir also has the advantage of a more open learn set than Scyther, so I teach TM39 Rock Tomb that we got for defeating Brock. With some type diversity on our moveset and outstanding stats for the early game, we bust through Mount Moon with haste, grabbing the Helix Fossil because Pinsir needs a new toy. Misty feels more threatening, so I decide to target Rival 2 first. With Rock Tomb on our side, we have a super effective physical move against both of his most threatening Pokémon, Pidgeotto and Charmander. Because of this, Pinscher is barely slowed down by Rival 2. I made sure to grab the TM for secret power for Pinscher as well before taking on Misty. We take out Staryu on turn 1, easily outspeeding and one-shotting. Her more powerful Starmie proves tougher, outspeeding us and hitting Water Pulse for exactly a third of our health, while our secret power is only doing slightly under half. Despite things starting to feel a little dire near the end, I'm confident that Pinscher would have survived one more Water Pulse from Starmie. 
My mind is already whirling away establishing my plan for the second playthrough. Just like Scyther, the Rival 3 fight on the SSN is a great demonstration of our growing power. We send our rival packing, only having lost 12 hit points. On the way out of the SSN, I make a quick stop to grab TM31 Brick Break. We will learn this move organically, but it's nice to have a little additional flexibility in our moveset options. With Pinsir's higher attack stat and lack of weakness to the electric type, it's no surprise that Lieutenant Surge's badge is even easier for Pinsir to obtain. Despite getting paralyzed twice throughout the fight, we smash through Surge, opening up the mid-game. Let's take a quick moment to see how our two competitors are doing. Pinsir defeated Lieutenant Surge at 24 minutes and 25 seconds, putting him nearly 6 minutes ahead of Scyther at 30 minutes and 16 seconds. But trust me, this race is far from over. In Rock Tunnel, I take a small detour that I haven't done in a run yet. It's a little difficult to see in the gameplay, but I'm down in this area of the map, where there's a move tutor that will teach us Rock Slide, a 75 base power rock move with 90 accuracy. A big improvement over Rock Tomb. When I get to Lavender Town, I make a quick trip south to the gatehouse to grab TM27 Return from this poor young lady who's lost her Pokémon and no longer needs it. It's actually quite sad, and I never truly take the time to appreciate her giving us this TM. Rest in peace. Return's base power is proportional to your friendship with your Pokémon, capping out at a maximum of 102. With another powerful physical move in our arsenal, I continue to Celadon City, doing the normal chores and beginning our push through the Rocket plotline. I actually hesitated on my way to Pokemon Tower because I thought I may not have a move that could hit ghosts as they are immune to both Return and Brick Break. Oh, right, I have Rock Slide, doy. I was so lost in thought that I didn't even heal before Rival 4. Whoops! It doesn't matter though as Pincher is so darn strong taking him out with ease. Our next stop is Sylphco, where I pick up all of the high-value items and TMs for cash. We're not interested in any high-value TMs for Pinsir, but optimizing our EV distribution with vitamins is going to be critical for the Pokémon Leagues. I make sure to grab and teach Pinsir TM8 Bulk Up, a setup move that increases our attack and defense by one stage. I had to pause the timer at this point in the game for a brief moment because nature called. Unfortunately, I must have done something wrong when I came back to the computer because OBS captured Rival 5 as a black screen. Do! You didn't miss much, trust me. Next we face Sabrina, and as a fast, strong physical attacker, we have a distinct advantage against her team. After setting up two bulk ups against her lead Kadabra, her entire team is a series of one shots, even with us being three levels lower than her ace Alakazam. I'm not even sure that that setup was necessary. With our bags full of items that we can sell, I make a stop at Celadon Department Store before heading south to Fuchsia City. I sell everything I deem unnecessary and reinvest all of our money into vitamins prioritizing proteins for our attack EVs. I want to do this before Cycling Road as it's full of attack EVs and with vitamins only being able to take us up to 100, we have plenty of room to acquire more before we hit the total EV cap. In Fuchsia, I stop at the Kangapen in front of the Safari Zone to have this dude teach us Substitute, easily one of the most powerful moves in this generation. Substitute sacrifices a quarter of your max HP to put up a decoy that takes hits. The greatest advantage to this is that in most cases, status effects don't penetrate the decoy, making us immune to moves that would put us to sleep, paralyze us, or reduce stats like Sand Attack. I haven't been doing any additional grinding, and I've only been defeating the mandatory trainers up to this point. Against Koga, you can see how Substitute works as we set one up while coughing fires off Sludge's against us. Because of the sub, the 30% chance to poison that Sludge has is ineffective. After setting up three bulk ups, we smash through Koga's team easily. I do have hidden power on my moveset now, and I'm using HP Rock with a base power of 70. This is slightly weaker than Rock Slide, but for 5 less power, I will definitely take 10% more accuracy. Oh, right, I almost forgot about Erica. I quickly pop back to Celadon City to take her on, defeating only the two trainers on the left side of the gym for some more attack EVs and one defense from Execute. I'm talking about that instead of Erica because, well, at this level, she's a piece of cake. We don't want to leave Scyther too far behind, so let's see how it handles the next few badges. Scyther is approaching a big power boost as it levels to 36 and we learn Swords Dance, a setup move that boosts our attack by two stages. I also made sure to grab TM40 Aerial Ace on Route 9. It has the same base power as Wing Attack at 60, but bypasses accuracy checks so we'll never miss. 
With our stab flying move after the Celadon chores, I decide to head straight to Erika. Even only three levels above her Pokemon, Shrimp slashes through her team. Well, we don't use slash, we use wing attack. I don't find slash as exciting as it was in Generation 1 with its insane, like, guaranteed crit rate. Next, we do the Rocket plotline. I got Shrimp's nickname from the Name Raider section on PKMN.net. It references the Mantis Shrimp, which is a species of shrimp known for their aggressive behavior, incredible attack speed, and sharp claws. Our nickname misleads our opponents, lulling them into a false sense of security until it's too late. I thought that was a pretty nifty nickname. We defeat Giovanni and level to 36 learning Swords Dance. This is when Scyther really powers up. I was about to start scripting about how Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower will be the first victim to fall to the power of Swords Dance. But Scyther just doesn't need it in this battle. Shrimp slices and dices his team without any setup. In hindsight, I may have been able to save a turn or two if I'd used it, but heh, I'm having fun. In Sylph, our goal is the same as Pinsir. We gather all of the high-value items in order to focus on vitamins for attack, and in Scyther's case, some defensive EVs as well. There are some nasty rock moves in both Pokémon leagues that we're gonna have to contend with. Scyther can't learn bulk up like Pinsir, but Swords Dance is a much better option anyway. Okay, so Rival 5 will demonstrate Swords Dance for us. Because it increases our attack by two stages, I only need to set up one while tanking a super effective wing attack from Pidgeot. Against Charizard, I use wing attack and oh boy, I was wrong. One Swords Dance was not enough, with our rival's ace holding on in red bar and burning away shrimp with a blaze boosted flamethrower. Alright, easy fix. I know that barring a critical hit, we will survive two wing attacks from Pidgeot, so this time I set up two Swords Dances, raising our attack by four stages, or three times our base attack stat. With the extra power, the rival's whole team stands no chance as we take them out one by one. Against Sabrina, we face a similar situation to Pinsir. This time, using only a single setup move, Shrimp easily dispatches of her whole team. Even with our reduced speed because of our nature, we still outspeed her ace Alakazam. Shrimp's route to Koga mirrors Pinsir's as well, as I buy vitamins, teach substitute, and aim for Koga. I got a little overexcited here, forgetting not only to save, but also to heal. We come into the fight at only half health. Not a worry though, as we set up two swords dances behind a sub and nuke coughing. Muck gets Okoed as well by Aerial Ace, and I have a problem. We're out of power points. I guess I'll use Reversal against Coughing, and despite the resistance, it falls in one. We do over half to Weezing as it strikes back with a sludge, bringing us into Red Bar and Poisoning Shrimp. After the poison damage ticks, we're left at one hit point. On the next turn, we take down Weezing, but wowza. If nothing else, we now know that we have a veritable canyon of a margin of error for that fight. My goodness. As Shrimp progresses to Cinnabar for another ridiculously close call, let's check out how he stacks up against Pinsir with six badges now. Scyther defeated Koga at 1 hour, 5 minutes, and 26 seconds, while Pinsir defeated Erika at 54 minutes and 39 seconds. Pinsir is definitely growing his lead to this point, but I did play Scyther first, making more mistakes, and because of the flying type, Scyther finds itself with more weaknesses in key battles. I just survive another fight at 1 HP. Whew. Blaine terrifies me. Because of two Intimidates reducing our attack stat from Growlithe and Arcanine, I assumed that I would need to set up twice. But we don't really get that opportunity as Growlithe's Fire Blasts are hitting for over half of our health, knocking out Shrimp on turn two. In my second attempt, I decide to test if I can take out Growlithe right away. It turns out that I can, getting an Oko with Aerial Ace on turn one, even at minus one attack. I would have liked to see Bounce from Ponyta, but instead I only get to set up once because it's still hitting Shrimp for over half with Fire Blast. Well, I guess let's go for it. Against Rapidash I get a crit, okay, not sure if that one mattered. Arcanine comes out intimidating us and I get another crit, what? Okay, I'm gonna take this victory, but that was incredibly lucky and I'm gonna have to figure out something better for the next run. I proceed to start clearing all of the trainers in Giovanni's gym. I think though that I'll be skipping this guy next time as his Rhyhorn's 4 times super effective Rock Blast absolutely destroys Shrimp. Don't worry though, remember, playthrough 1 is all about learning. 
Giovanni time, and after that little incident against the level 43 Rhyhorn, I'm very wary of his level 45 and 50 Rhyhorns. Never thought I'd be saying that one. Because I'm becoming more and more familiar with the quirky Gen 3 AI, I decide to set up a sub predicting Scary Face. I'm correct, and it fails to hit as I set up. Reversal fails to knock out his second Rhyhorn, allowing it to use Rock Blast. Here we go. The first hit breaks our sub, then fortunately it only hits three times, leaving Shrimp in red bar. Now that Reversal is turned up to 100 base power though, Rhyhorn stands no chance. With our setup, Aerial Ace then clear cuts Doug Trio and the Nidos, thankfully only being affected by Poison Point on his last Pokemon, Nidoking. That was still a little too close for comfort. Coming into Rival 6, I know that half of Pidgeot's moveset are stat-reducing moves, Feather Dance and Sand Attack. He just wants to be a butt the whole time though, so I only managed to set up one Sword Stance before taking it down. One was not enough again, as Reversal fails to take down Rhyhorn, subjecting Shrimp to another Rock Blast and another defeat. I ended up wiping three more times before I decided to go do some training. I targeted Cycling Road and the Fighting Dojo and Saffron for the attack EVs and trainer density, coming back at level 58. I swear the AI is reading my move choice here, the big cheater. Every time I Swords Dance, he Feather Dances. Every time I Substitute, he attacks. So I'm net zero just losing health until I finally get one Swords Dance in. Get out of here. Thankfully, with the extra levels, that was enough this time, as Shrimp Oko's Rhyhorn with Reversal, then Aerial Ace deals with Charizard, Execute, Alakazam, and finally Gyarados. Scyther enters the Pokemon League doors at 1 hour, 26 minutes, and 26 seconds. Let's see how Pinsir handles these last few key battles. Now feels like a good time to talk about Pinsir's ability Hypercutter, which prevents the loss of attack caused by an opponent in battle. You might have caught it at the start of the Blaine battle, as Growlithe Intimidate does not affect Pinsir. Mold Breaker though would have been sweet. It would have allowed Pinsir's Earthquake, for instance, to hit Agatha's Ghosts that have Levitate, making them otherwise immune to ground-type moves. Anyway, focusing on this battle, I set up to plus one with Bulk Up and begin sweeping Blaine's team after Growlithe hits a massive Fire Blast. We would not have survived a second. HP Rock is super effective here and we outspeed his Pokemon, giving Pinsir a tight but decisive victory over the Fire-type leader. In Giovanni's gym, I defeat two additional trainers along with the mandatory two. This brings Pinscher up to level 49, finally gaining access to Sword Stance as well. We're hitting all rock types at the moment for resisted damage, but that's about to change. It also doesn't matter because Pinscher is a monster. Against the man himself, we can rely on that quirky old AI following in Shrimp's footsteps, setting up a substitute to avoid scary faces. I'm wary of both Rhyhorn's Rock Blast, so I set all the way up to plus six using three Sword Stance. Once we're set up, the battle is a foregone conclusion. Outspeeding and getting an Oko on both Rhyhorns, Doug Trio, and the King and Queen of Nidos. Jumping right into Rival 6, Pinscher handles the battle without needing any additional grinding. Pidgeot is still enjoying going full offense, so I only managed to set up a single sword stance before knocking it out. We only have 44 health for the rest of the battle though. Okay, please one-shot the Rhyhorn. Uh-oh, we didn't. It just goes for takedown though, so we're okay taking it down on the next round. From there, his Charizard, Execute, Alakazam, and Gyarados all fall to a single shot. Pinscher definitely had an advantage being played second and being monotype, making it less frail in many key battles. Pinscher enters the league doors at 1 hour, 5 minutes, and 46 seconds, putting him 20 minutes and 40 seconds ahead of Scyther. Welcome to the Round 1 Elite Four. We start off trying to set up a sub against Lorelei's Dugong. Nope, that's not gonna work, so I switch to Sword Stance, taking a Surf that brings Pincher down to 59 health before taking it out. Cloyster has one of the highest defensive stats to this day, with a base stat of 180. Because of this, it tanks an HP Rock and Red Bar, but if we're doing that much to Cloyster, I'm confident that this battle belongs to us. It wastes some time healing and protecting, but can't stand up to Pincher's power. Oh, but right, Slowbro is pretty defensive too with nearly double Cloyster's health pool and isn't weak to rock. It survives our attack with about half health, taking down Pincher with a Surf. 
I try again immediately using one rare candy bringing us over a damage rounding threshold. This time too I opt to set up two swords dances against Dugong before taking it out. As a result, Lorelei's Cloyster, Slowbro, Lapras, and definitely Jinx all fall to a single shot. Against Bruno, I get some great information from his lead Onyx. Our sub can survive one Rock Tomb for sure giving us the green light on some free-ish setup. I also taught Earthquake over Return before starting the league, so we have a super effective move and take out Onyx only having set up one sword stance. Our 100 base power ground move really shakes up Bruno as we proceed to Oko his Hitmonchan, Machamp, Hitmonlee, and second Onyx. Notice too that we're slightly under leveled, being two levels lower than his ace Machamp. Against Agatha, the power of substitute shows as Pincher can't be affected by this Gengar at all, barring a super weak Shadow Punch. I set up to plus four, which might have been excessive, and then start missing over and over against the double team spamming Gengar. Ugh, evasion. Once again, with our setup, we blast through Agatha's team with only her ace Gengar outspeeding and breaking our sub. But that was about the conclusion of any threat that Agatha may have posed to our bug-type juggernaut. Hypercutter is definitely better than Scyther's Swarm as we come into Lance, bypassing his lead Gyarados' Intimidate. I set up again to plus four and then try to establish a sub, forgetting how to math. At 160 HP, our sub will have a quarter of that, so 40 HP. The fixed damage move Dragon Rage also does 40 hit damage. So I waste a turn and a quarter of our health before taking it out. The consequence of this is that the Speed Demon Aerodactyl comes out moving first and blowing away Pincher with a stab super effective wing attack. I repeat the same strategy, but this time, instead of using Dragon Rage after I set up a sub, Gyarados uses Bite, so we come into Aerodactyl protected. That's all I needed to have a successful Lance battle it seems, as once Aerodactyl faints after our sub blocks its hit, we outspeed and Oko his Ace Dragonite and two Dragonairs in the back. We level up to 56 by the end of the fight. My goodness, Pinsir is a strong Pokémon. So far, Pinsir has had a dominant Pokémon lead, but the champion is the true test. Against Pidgeot, I set up a sub, dodging a sand attack turn 1. Then, with some safety, I set up one sword stance while Pidgeot disposes of our sub. That's enough for it though, and a single HP rock knocks it out. Rhydon falls to a single Earthquake and Charizard is out. He misses a Fire Blast while we fire back HP Rock for 4 times damage. I honestly don't think we would have survived that, so note to self, outspeed Charizard next time. My concern is validated as on the next turn, Alakazam also outspeeds, hitting a massive Psychic for over half of our total health. Because of the damage we suffered to this point, we don't do nearly enough to Exeggutor, allowing it to hit a resisted Giga Drain, taking out Pincher. Alright, I've only used one rare candy to this point, so I'm used two more, bringing Pincher to level 58 over the next damage rounding threshold. I leave Pidgeot in the same state as last attempt, but with less health. Rhydon falls, and now we're outspeeding Charizard for an easy Oko. Alakazam is incredibly fast too though, and outspeeds again, taking us out. Charizard has 150 speed, which we now surpass, and Alakazam has 159, so... Two more rare candies, and now at level 60 I go for it again. I get greedy against Pidgeot though, exposing myself to a sand attack while I set up a second swords dance. That leads to a miss against Rhydon, who hits Rock Tomb, lowering our speed. Charizard now outspeeds again, and yeah. I then wipe again, and I think my frustration shows here as I level up to 65, setting up to plus 2 and coming out of Pidgeot at around half health. With our speed intact though, we sweep through Rhydon, Charizard, and Alakazam. Executor survives at half health, putting Pincher to sleep. Oh no. But it's all good, as Pincher wakes up after one turn of snoozing and takes out the coconut Pokémon and the following Gyarados. Note to self, bring a Chesto Berry next time. I write down a couple of quick notes while Oak babbles and takes us to the Hall of Fame. Pinsir clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 40 seconds at level 65 with 7 resets. This took 4 hours and 31 minutes of game time. Shrimp the Scyther doesn't have a very inspiring introduction to the Round 2 League. This is another example of the flying type putting Scyther at a disadvantage in this game. Dugong quickly takes us out with a critical hit, super effective Ice Beam. I wipe again to Dugong after getting frozen and try again. 
this time Dugong seems like it wants to set up, establishing Hail and Safeguard while Shrimp sets up to plus 4 with Swords Dance. Because of getting the opportunity to set up, we can Oko her following Slowbro, Jinx, Lapras, and Cloyster. A glass cannon, you are! Against Bruno, Scyther has yet another disadvantage compared to Pinsir. Rock Tomb is doing 4 times damage to us, so our sub definitely won't survive. Onyx hits a crit Rock Tomb, bringing us down to only 10 HP and lowering our speed while we set up a single Swords Dance. Well, when in Rome, let's just go for it. We outspeed and one-shot Hitmonchan and Machamp, which is awesome. The speedier Hitmonlee comes out though and Mega Kicks Shrimp for the knockout. I wipe some more and come back after finally getting rid of Reversal, replacing it with Steel Wing. At plus two, we one-shot Onyx, Hitmonchan, and Machamp. Despite our lower speed, we outspeed every Pokémon except Hitmonlee. Because I didn't beat around the bush with Onyx this time though, Shrimp has more than enough health to tank a Mega Kick, taking out Hitmonlee and then the following Onyx. Agatha is finally a battle where Scyther has a small advantage to Pinsir. Against her lead Gengar, we set up a sub and go to plus 4 attack with Swords Dance. Aerial Ace cannot miss, so despite her Gengar's attempt to be lame, Shrimp squints his eyes at the last second seeing right through her baloney. It's an easy sweep from there, taking out Golbat, Arbok, her Ace Gengar, and finally Haunter. Oh, a breath of fresh air. Lance, on the other hand, won't be. Granted, I do make some silly move choices against Gyarados, and he keeps spamming Dragon Rage for 80 damage over two turns, but I do get to plus four. This isn't enough though, as his Ace Dragonite comes out hitting a super effective Stab Wing attack, way more than Shrimp can handle. I rack up some more resets, and this time I try something new. I set up all the way to plus 6, tanking hits from the Gyarados, and then on the last turn I set up a sub so that we can survive that darn Aerodactyl in the back. We're only at 37 health, but from behind a sub at plus 6, this should be okay. Dragonite falls in 1, then Aerodactyl comes out. We only get one shot at this, and Steel Wing only has 90% accuracy. We click the button, and... We hit! Aerodactyl falls, and then the two remaining Dragonairs are an easy cleanup. All right. Ironically enough, Shrimp actually has quite an easy champion battle. Pidgeot seems dead set on lowering our accuracy, so as we chill behind our sub, we set all the way up to plus six. We then outspeed and Oko, his remaining Rhydon, Charizard, Alakazam, Executor, and finally, Gyarados. Alright, I have to be honest with you all, I'm pretty sure that Scyther is going to lose this race on the first playthrough, but I have seen so, so, so many opportunities to improve, so I predict that Shrimp is going to save way more time in the next run than Pinsir will. Shrimp clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 34 minutes, and 52 seconds at level 64 with 22 resets. This took 4 hours and 58 minutes of game time. We'll compare our times after we finish the Round 2 League. We jump right back in after clearing the Sevi Island plotline. The Round 2 League has been leveled up by around 12 levels for every Pokémon and there have been some team changes. Against Dugong, we set up Sword Stance while it sets up double teams for the first three turns. Shrimp doesn't mind though, using Aerial Ace for the guaranteed hit and knocks it out. Because of the setup that Dugong afforded us, we sweep through her Jinx, Cloyster, Piloswine, and lastly, her Ace Lapras. I'm thinking that Bruno is going to be very similar to round one. I test to see if our sub can survive a rock tomb, definitely not. I set up to plus two and because of Steelix's absurd 200 base defense, HP ground only knocks it into yellow bar. He then misses a rock tomb, so okay, let's do this. We outspeed and Oko is Hitmonchan, Machamp, and this time even is Hitmonlee, bringing us to Steelix 2. Shrimp gets a crit here, taking it out in one shot. Okay, that fight was super lucky. I am gonna have to test that one a lot. Like, a bunch of a lot. Before Agatha, I realized something silly. I haven't had my leftovers equipped this whole time. Whoops! In this battle, we set up to plus two, but I want to make a quick note about the danger that can pose. If we get confused, our boosted attack stat will make us hit ourselves for more damage. Against Crobat, we see the effect of that as we hit ourselves twice in a row, and combined with Crobat's air cutter, Shrimp Falls. 
After that Bruno fight though, I can't even be mad. On the next attempt, I follow the exact same strategy, but this time we don't get super unlucky and roll through her Gengar, Mischievous, Crobat with a crit, her Ace Gengar, and Arbok. As always, with a setup move and substitute, Dragon Doctoral Lance is pretty much free. We set all the way up to plus 6. Well, plus 5 because of Intimidate, because his dragons are not to be sneezed at before taking out Gyarados. We then sweep through his next three team members, two Dragonites and a Kingdra, bringing us to the Aerodactyl who outspeeds breaking our sub. We only knock it down into Red Bar 2, so after he enters a healing loop for a few turns, he outspeeds and gets a clean Oko against us from full with Ancient Power. That wasn't even a crit. I use a single rare candy, taking Shrimp to level 73 over a damage rounding threshold and perform the exact same strategy. Because of that little additional damage though, Aerodactyl can't take it a hit and falls in one. Alright, Champion 2 time. I wipe twice against him, so I use two rare candies bringing us up to level 75 over another damage rounding threshold. Heracross is a massive threat, so the best course is to take it out immediately with a 4 times super effective Aerial Ace. I then, funny enough, use Tyranitar to set up against. He's doing some massive damage to us, but it gives us just enough of a window that I can set up to plus 4 before taking him out. Because of our speed and setup, we then Oko is following Charizard, Alakazam, Executor, and Gyarados. Shrimp has defeated the Round 2 League. Scyther has definitely had a lot more struggles throughout the game compared to Pinsir, but with the medium fast growth rate and the knowledge that I now have, I think I can save a lot of time in my second playthrough. Shrimp clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 58 minutes and 45 seconds at level 76 with 26 resets. This took 6 hours and 17 minutes of game time. Pinscher had a fairly straightforward round 1 league, so let's see how he holds up in round 2. Just like Scyther, we engage in a small setup war against Dugong, setting up sword stances while Dugong sets up double teams. Before things get out of hand though, I only set up to plus 4 before taking it out. Pinscher's might then carries us through the rest of the battle, outspeeding and one-shotting Piloswine, Cloyster, Jinx, and finally Lapras. Bruno should be much easier for Pinscher than he was for Shrimp. I make a silly move choice early, exposing myself to a Rock Tomb and Speed Drop while setting up to plus 4. Steelix 1 falls along with Hitmonchan. Hitmon Lee comes out and because of our reduced speed he hits a chunky Rock Slide, bringing Pinscher under half health. It's all good though as we one shot it, Machamp and Steelix 2 for another dominant victory for Pinscher. Agatha also isn't an issue for Pinscher, as when you can outspeed her lead Gengar and establish a sub, she really isn't that threatening. That's not to say that things can't go wrong as we saw with Shrimp, but it's fairly consistent. We set up to plus 4 again and get out our brooms for another clean sweep. While the Lance footage plays, let's take a quick moment to admire these two bug Pokemon. I've always had a bias against the bug type because for most vanilla playthroughs of the game, they exist only as early game fodder to be fed to your growing, um, real Pokemon. These runs have changed my mind about that, and I'm looking so forward to my second playthroughs so that we can see just what these two can accomplish. As it turns out, the Round 2 champion, similarly to the Round 1 champion, poses a real problem for Pinscher. I ended up wiping 5 times here and used every rare candy that I had, bringing us up to level 77. Against Heracross, I needed a bit more defense so that my sub can survive a Rock Tomb, but it doesn't survive every time. I only managed to get to plus 4 and then I have to take it out as things are getting a little dangerous. Tyranitar, Charizard, and Alakazam all fall to a single hit, but as I discovered, we're far from out of the woods yet. I re-sub against Executor, dodging a sleep powder that would have ruined my day otherwise. Trust me. I then set up one last sword stance as it breaks our sub with Psychic. I can now one-shot it with HP Rock. Gyarados is in the back and poses no threat as we outspeed it and take it down. Whew, what a ride! Both of these Pokemon, particularly Scyther, are going to require some serious routing for me to really feel like I've optimized their times. There are some interesting sticking points for both that pop out throughout the game, but I feel that Pinscher was definitely more intuitive to play, giving it a faster first playthrough. Pinscher clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 39 minutes and 33 seconds at level 77 with 12 resets. This took 5 hours and 50 minutes of game time. 
we'll do a quick comparison of our times before jumping into our second playthroughs. In round 1, Scyther made up a little bit of time in the league, but still fell 19 minutes and 12 seconds behind Pinsir. Incredibly, in round 2, despite having a rougher time, Shrimp maintained that exact number of 19 minutes and 12 seconds, so I am filled with confidence that this is going to be a tight race in the second playthroughs. We'll start with how I changed Pinsir in the second playthrough. I didn't change anything about Pinsir except that Flail is now our egg move as Faint Attack was not particularly useful. For Brock we need level 13, so here's some quick math. Level 13 for a slow growth rate Pokemon requires 2746 total experience. I know that all of the trainers before Brock, including the two rival battles, total 1721 experience. We also start the game at level 5, so that's 156 experience that we don't need. So after some quick arithmetic, we now know that Pinsir needs to obtain 869 nice, experience from wild battles. I find the easiest way to track that is adding some numbers back into our current XP and determining what level we need to be at to advance. We start at 156 experience, plus the lab battle is 70 for 226, and then we'll do our wild battles before Rival 1.5 in the grass on Route 22. That will yield both attack and speed EVs. 226 plus our wild battles is a total experience pool of 1095, or level 9, which requires 911 experience, plus 184, which will level us perfectly to 13 before Brock. Easy, right? Because of our planning and the power of Seismic Toss, we get a fairly easy battle against Brock. Pinsir is moving on at 10 minutes on the clock. This is only a couple seconds faster than last time, but this time, we've gained more EVs and attack. Pinsir's first run was incredibly intuitive to play, so there won't be many changes throughout, just a bit of smarter play on my part. Because of Rock Tomb from Brock, we blast through the early game defeating Rival 2, Misty, Rival 3, and Lieutenant Surge easily. The only difference to this point is that I taught Dig to Pinsir, but because it's a slower two-turn move, I've only used it against Surge's Raichu. That's all it will be used for ever, so in hindsight, probably not worth teaching it here. In this playthrough, I got lucky finding TM10 hidden power early from Meowth's pickup ability, so I also skipped teaching Rock Slide and Rock Tunnel. I then clear the Rocket Hideout and Rival 4, leading us to Sylph. I know I'm blowing through everything super quickly, but really, aside from our pre-Brock strategy, nothing has changed in this run so far. Let's take a minute to see how the Rival 5 battle goes. We're about to make our first shift in strategy. We're at a lower level than last time, at only level 36 when we enter the battle. I set up two bulk ups against Pidgeot while it fires off a barrage of wing attacks. HP Rock takes it out. I was a little worried about our speed at this lower level, but it isn't an issue as even the super fast Alakazam gets outsped and one shot. Pinsir is a monster. I then finish the rocket plotline defeating Giovanni and take down Sabrina. Now we head to Celadon Department Store to grab vitamins. I also grab an extra copy of TM28 Dig for Meowth because escape ropes are single use and the environment appreciates reusability. It's much more fun to dig holes through buildings anyway. Unlike last time, I now dip down to defeat Erica, and then I clear all of the trainers on Cycling Road, which I did not do last time. We need a bit more experience to make the Round 2 Champion battle more consistent. If you notice that I'm moving a little bit slower between battles, it's because I put an extra keybind on my controller to be able to toggle from 4 times game speed to normal and back. My Pokémon's time shouldn't suffer as I bonk on things with suboptimal inputs. I then defeat Koga and the Fighting Dojo back in Saffron City. This serves two purposes. I'm getting as many attack EVs as I can muster, while also setting us up to be level 49, learning Swords Dance before Blaine. We got lucky last time. We get lucky again this time with Growlithe missing Fire Blast, so at plus two we're rolling through Blaine's team with HP Rock. Next is Giovanni one last time, followed by Rival 6 before the League. Pinsir hits the League doors at 1 hour, 9 minutes, and 46 seconds. This is actually 4 minutes slower than last run, but with some additional grinding setting us up for round 2. Again, because of how intuitively Pinsir played in the last League, there isn't much that's changed in our strategy. I level up using 5 rare candies, bringing us to level 60 before starting. Against Lorelei, I set up to plus 4 with Sword Stance and stomp through her entire team, with the only damage we suffer being from Hail. 
Pinsir's ability to set up a sub and have it tank a rock to him, despite our weakness, pretty much guarantees the Bruno battle. I only set up to plus two before starting the sweep, misclicking against Hitmonchan, but the only way I can lose this battle is if I throw it away. Bruno falls. Um, what do I have to say here? Sub plus two Agatha? Against Lance, I make a small tweak and equip a Citrus Berry before the fight, giving us another 30 HP to play with. I set all the way up to plus 6 against Gyarados, and sub on the last turn so that Aerodactyl can't take us out. It breaks our sub while we break it and the rest of Lance's team. We're on to the champion with zero resets. I equip a Chesto Berry for safety against Executor before walking into the champion's room. I make some misplays against Pidgeot, sacrificing a lot of health unnecessarily. I do recover from my flub against Rhydon though, so now we're at plus 4 with our stats intact, but only 31 HP after leveling up. At level 63 though, we outspeed and one-shot Charizard, Alakazam, Executor, and Gyarados, finishing a dominant performance over the entire Kanto region and Round 1 Elite Four. Pinsir really didn't need much work done to it. It far surpassed my initial expectations of a simple bug Pokémon with a cool sprite. Pinsir clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 15 minutes, and 22 seconds at level 63 with 0 resets. This took 4 hours and 46 minutes of game time. For real time, we completed the league 18 seconds slower than last run, but have a much better foundation laid for round 2. I wonder how Scyther's second run is going. Scyther's first change is to its nature. I did some quick math and calculated the probability of using a special move with Scyther. Zero multiplied by any other number is zero. So instead of a brave nature, we've gone with adamant, increasing attack and lowering special attack instead of speed. I know I said at the start of last run that speed didn't matter past a certain point. Though that remains true, we didn't quite hit that threshold last run. Second is better implementation of the Brock plan that I discovered last run. This time I defeat all of the bug catchers in Viridian Forest except Charlie, instead knocking out a few wild encounters along the way. We should only need level 10 for the Brock fight, but we will need a favorable damage range. I enter Brock's gym, monitoring my health diligently. I find the poison ticks a little difficult to see at 4 times game speed, so I'm constantly checking my Scyther's health until we get to 1 HP. I use an antidote, and let's hope this plan works. Skipping Charlie has two benefits. One, he consumes a lot of quick attacks with two metapods, and two, we can balance our XP better without having to grind more, so that we're just barely level 10 for Geodude. A one-shot with reversal, and we're good. Now I know this is a range, so I cross my fingers. Come on, Scyther, get the one-shot. Oh no, we didn't get it. My heart sinks and... Onyx misses! Rock Tomb only has 80% accuracy. That's gonna be important later. We take down Onyx on the next turn. We have a run. Scyther swipes sweeping swaths through Route 3, 4, and Mount Moon. I clear a couple of extra trainers along the way, including Swimmer Louise in Misty's Gym, in order to hit level 18 before I go to attempt Rival 2. I come into the battle, and we have our flub of the day. Somebody didn't heal. Well, shucks. I take my lickens and reset. After that Brock fight, I have such a good feeling about this run, though. Like, in my bones, I know it's gonna be great. Pidgeotto gets off a sand attack on turn one, but one we can manage. Unless we then miss three out of four of the next turns. We wipe again. I'm, I'm not joking here. This shook me up a bit, but that feeling stuck around. I exchanged two turns with Pidgeotto this time without it lowering our accuracy, but unfortunately, once I take him out with Quick Attack, we're only at half health for the rest of the battle. Reversal is now doing more damage, so I switch to it while Charmander unleashes an Ember. Oh boy, we live at nine hit points. Go, go, Scyther! Our now super-powered Reversal takes out Charmander, then Quick Attack Abra. Rattata is last, and with no priority Quick Attack, we take it out too. Based on the last run though, Quick Attack would not have knocked us out without a crit. I accidentally ran a bit too far forward and had to fight Picnicker Diana, but after clearing our way through Bill's house, making sure to grab TM43 Secret Power, it's time for Misty. Her lead star you is an Oko. I go for Quick Attack turn 1 against Starmie because I was worried about knocking it into heal range, which I do anyway on the next turn with Secret Power. Then after she heals, I get a lucky crit, taking Starmie to a sliver. One final secret power takes it out. Misty falls and we're starting to gain some real momentum. 
I wasn't gonna show this Rival 3 fight, but Scyther is getting in the groove, man. Turn 1 Paralysis against Pidgeotto with Secret Power, and it's fully paralyzed. A quick attack cleans it up. Charmeleon is next, we outspeed, and Paralysis turn 1 with Secret Power again, and he's fully paralyzed. A follow-up Secret Power takes him out. We Oko Raticate without taking a quick attack, and Kadabra falls too. Scyther defeats Rival U with full health. I told you I had a feeling about this run. With a Cherry Berry equipped, we steal ourselves for Lieutenant Surge. He is the last hurdle for a long while for Scyther. Turn 1, we take Voltorb into Deep Red with Secret Power, getting another Paralysis. He heals as we fire off Wing Attacks for over half and another to take it out. Pikachu is an Oko and out comes Raichu. Secret Power takes him to around a quarter as he fires off a Thunder Wave paralyzing Scyther. Our Cherry Berry activates, he doesn't heal, and we take down his ace. Surge is down and we're ready for some clear cutting of the mid game. From there the mid game is much like the last run. I defeat Erika, the Rocket Hideout, and Rival 4 at Pokemon Tower. In between I gave the T to the guard, unlocking Saffron and buying Max Repels as usual, but also cleared out the Fighting Dojo quickly on the way. I'm doing the same training that I ended up doing last run, only earlier. We find ourselves back in Sylph after gathering all of the high value items and vitamins to either use or sell. We'll be maxing Scyther's attack, speed, then defense in that order. This brings us to Rival 5. You can see the effects of that little bit of extra grinding already. At level 43, we're taking Pidgeot's wing attacks much better, setting up to plus 4 while being knocked to about a third health. Plus 4 is enough, as Scyther aerial aces through the rival's remaining team members like a hot knife through butter. I then defeat Giovanni and Sabrina, max out our vitamins and Celadon, and then defeat every trainer on Cycling Road, and finally Koga. All of this is setting us up for our Blaine strategy. Oh boy did we ever get lucky last time. I come into Blaine at level 55, and we were only 48 last time. This time, too, I come equipped with HP Ground that we need for the Round 2 League. Because of our higher level, Growlithe is still doing massive damage, but we can survive two Fire Blasts with a bit of a margin for error, setting up to plus four. I did have a Rostberry equipped, just in case, but Growlithe didn't burn us, and Blaine's remaining team is a clean sweep with HP Ground, even after Arcanine's Intimidate. Giovanni is our final gym leader, and I have been clearing additional trainers in both gyms so that we are now at level 58. Rhyhorn breaks our sub early with Rock Blast, but we got the setup that we needed to sweep his team. Rival 6 gets crushed, so Scyther finds himself very quickly at the league doors at 1 hours, 8 minutes, and 12 seconds. Wait, what? That's 21 minutes earlier than last run and one and a half minutes faster than Pinsir's second run. That's right, in our second playthrough, Scyther has been the dominant one, but look at how close they've been throughout the runs, with Pinsir even passing Scyther, then losing his lead again. Scyther did have a harder time in the two leagues though. Let's see if my routing made the difference. Against Lorelei, we're coming in at a higher level than last time. We set up to plus four while Dugong sets up Hail and Safeguard. Too bad Safeguard doesn't protect you from Aerial Aces from a monstrous Mantis. Just like Pinsir, we take her down having only suffered Hail damage. Bruno is next, and if I had enough speed to be able to take on his team at minus one speed last run, you best believe we can do it this time. I set up to plus two with Onyx activating the Citrus Berry I had equipped as Lorelei safety. Hitmonchan, Machamp, and Hitmonlee are all Okos, and we even outspeed Hitmonlee this time. His final Onyx gets ground down with Hidden Power for an easy win. Agatha setup is easy behind a sub, so we go to plus four and ignoring her evasion with Aerial Ace slash our way through her team as well. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Against Lance, I have our second and final Citrus Berry equipped for safety. Set up here can be dangerous. I set all the way up to plus six using four Swords Dances to account for the Intimidate while Gyarados spams Dragon Rages. Come on man, did you forget Bite and Twister suddenly? Our Citrus Berry activates and we set up our sub while Gyarados fires off a Hyper Beam. We take it out, but we have no sub and only 13 HP. Aerodactyl is out. Come on, adamant nature. Please tell me that we outspeed this time. I click Aerial Ace. We do! At plus six, do we one shot? Yes! The rest of Lance's team is an easy sweep. That was amazing. 
champion time. I begin my setup with Pidgeot using Feather Dance turn 1. Rude. I think to myself, okay, he's going for stat changes this time, going for a sub. Nope. Alright, enough of this, I'm just gonna set up. I set up to plus 4 while Pidgeot knocks us down to 12 hit points. Them defense EVs, Aerial Ace is an Oko. We're fast and set up, so with HP ground for Rhydon and Aerial Ace for everyone else, Scyther mows down the last of the round 1 league. What a performance. I'm going to keep the splits off screen for now because this race is tight. We're going to pop back to Pinsir after this to see what the bar to beat is going to be set at. Scyther clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 12 minutes, and 52 seconds at level 66 with only 2 resets. This took 4 hours and 35 minutes of game time. Alright Pinsir, the stage is set and it's your show. Let's set that bar high. I used 5 rare candies after the Sevi Islands bringing Pinsir to level 75. I start setting up with Swords Dances and Dugong uses Ice Beam freezing me turn 1. Please. 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 Please? Oh my goodness. Okay, let's go. We finally thaw and take it out. We're overleveled in preparation for the later league, so I think plus two should be enough. It turns out I'm right as we sweep through her remaining Pokemon with Pinsir's exceptional attack stat. Let's also thank the unsung hero leftovers here. With Scyther hot on our heels, that was a little nerve-wracking. Against Bruno, I can tank a Rock Tomb from Steelix, so I use that to my advantage, keeping myself behind a sub and setting up to plus four before going on my offensive. Hitmonchan, Hitmonlee, Machamp, and his second Steelix all fall to Pinsir's Wrath. Round 2 Agatha remains a joke behind a substitute. I set up to plus 4 once again and level her squad with HP Rock and Earthquake for Arbok. Round 2 Lance has that pesky Thunder Wave and Gyarados lead, so from behind a sub we set up with Impunity. Such a hack. I'm almost in a love-hate relationship with it at this point. We set up all the way and destroy one of the most powerful teams in the game without breaking a sweat. Time for the Round 2 Champion. Pinsir again has the advantage of being able to tank some shenanigans from Heracross. I continue setting up subs as he breaks them, setting us up to plus 4. I can't afford to be hit by a Rock Tomb, we need our speed intact. Having our sub survivor Rock Tomb is a range though, so after a few instant breaks I use HP Rock to take him out. We outspeed an Oko Tyranitar, Charizard, and Alakazam. I want a bit of safety against Execute, so I try putting up a sub predicting Sleep Powder so I can get to plus 6. No dice this time as he uses Psychic, so now the Sandstorm and Leftovers have us bouncing between 12 and 25 HP. I select HP Rock and we get the Oko, yes! Gyarados is last, we ignore the Intimidate with Hypercutter and our plus 4 super effective HP Rock blasts away the champion's last Pokemon. Despite a touch of bad luck, that was a buttery smooth round 2 league. And the best part? Pinsir got through all of it without a single reset. Pinsir clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 35 minutes, and 43 seconds at level 78 with zero resets. This took 6 hours and 4 minutes of game time. Alright Scyther, it looks like the bar is set quite high. Let's see what you're made of. Against Lorelei, we have a setup war with us going to plus 6 with Swords Dance while she sets up 3 double teams. Aerial Ace can't miss, so we take it out and all of her remaining team fall to the same fate. Scyther busts out of the gate strong. Remember how I got ridiculously lucky here last run and I predicted Bruno would be a massive problem? I'd like to raise that to a gargantuan problem. The only, and I do mean only way I could figure this one out without leveling into absurdity was to play for a Rock Tomb miss. That's it. Pure, unbiased luck. Let's hope that that feeling I had is still paying dividends. In the first fight, it isn't. Followed by a nope, and that's a nope. Gonna be a nope. Yep, that's another one. Aha! There it is. Use it, use it. For context, I've been tanking one Rock Tomb, then using Substitute, hoping for a miss until it finally happened. 80%, yeah right. With a single miss, we can set up to plus 4 and begin our sweep. We outspeed an Oko, Hitmonchan, Hitmonlee, Machamp, and his second Steelix. Alright, we definitely lost some time there, but that was way faster than leveling into the 90s. 
time for a breath of air while we recover from that one. Agatha's lead Gengar does decide to toss in a psychic amidst the perpetually failing hypnosis attempts against our decoys, so we need to resub. Beyond that, plus four, and sweep! Dragon Doctoral Lance is definitely a nice sit back and mentally realign kind of fight, ironic as that may be. By now you all know the drill, plus six and sweep. Hey, 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 why did the broomstick yawn? It was sweepy. <laughs> It all comes down to the round 2 champion. Heracross is too threatening to Scyther, so we take it out immediately with a 4 times super effective Aerial Ace. Tyranitar is where we need to set up. At this level, we can take 2 Thunderbolts from it. Please no crit, please no paralysis. We set up to plus 4, avoiding those nasty outcomes, and take it down. While bouncing between 21 and 34 health, Scyther takes out his sweepy broom and dusts off the remainder of the champion's team with a series of Okos. Scyther has done it. I breathed a massive sigh of relief at the end of that fight. This run was a stressful one for me because I knew Scyther had so much to give, I just had to find out how to facilitate it. Scyther clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 32 minutes, and 39 seconds at level 77 with 7 resets. This took 5 hours and 42 minutes of game time. Oh, what a rush! And our winner is... Scyther. Clocking in 3 minutes and 4 seconds ahead of Pinsir despite some shenanigans of Bruno. Pinsir ended up saving 3 minutes and 50 seconds over last run. I definitely played a bit more conservatively with him in the second run and maybe that could have shaved off a couple of minutes with more practice. Scyther is the true MVP today though, coming in first and saving a total of 26 minutes and 6 seconds over last run, and coming back from what seemed to be an unsurpassable time difference set by Pinsir in the first playthrough. Alright, let's rank these two. Both of their times fit snugly between Clefairy and Gardevoir, so for now they find themselves among the top performers in the S tier. Before things get out of hand, I also bumped Gardevoir down from S to A. It's nothing personal, I just have no idea what I'm doing. Get a little bit better every day, that's my motto. These runs ended up not being what I was excited about initially, but wow, am I ever happy with how they turned out. I feel like I could shave off time on both runs, but this is a fair representation of both Pokémon. Pinsir's slow growth rate really holds it back, but it's so powerful that it more than makes up for it. Scyther is another glass cannon that once you figure out your ranges and what you can survive can be incredibly potent. If you've made it to the end of the video, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my second versus video and the intro screen that I made for these two. I'm still learning and trying to, um, what's the digital equivalent of putting my ideas on paper? Uh, yeah, whatever that is. As I continue to strive for higher quality and to scratch that ever-present itch of finding better strategies. If you feel like I've earned it, leave a like and comment about your thoughts. Is there something that you would have done differently? I'd love to hear about it. You can even just stop and say hi. Bye. If you'd like to keep up with my releases in the future, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell so you never miss these excellent videos. After all, substrats, best strats. Until next time, take care everyone.